So welcome, welcome to IHN, welcome to the talk. I'm pretty excited about uh, the talk today. Um, it's been a little while since I've switched it up, so I've done some GMO talks, I've done some environmental medicine talks and so on, so it's, uh, it's nice to be doing something um, a little different for me. Um, before we get going, um, we're going to get into all of the nitty gritty today. Um, what is blood sugar? Um, how to uh, control things with diet, with supplements, what's actually involved and so on. But just as a bit of a preempt, um, I can't stress enough, you know, after being in practice for 10 years, uh, how many people actually have subtle signs, uh, sometimes very aggressive signs of hypoglycemia or low blood sugar. Um, and I will also say this, that correcting blood sugar is probably one of the first things you need to do in order to progress into further programs and uh, recapture your health. Uh, it's one of the things that people often overlook, uh, practitioners, um, lay people alike. And what happens is we sort of put the cart before the horse. We start uh, working on other things, but meanwhile the blood sugar is all up and down. Um, it's very difficult to get results. So hopefully today I can share with you some very basic tools and tips. Um, it's one of those things that can actually be rectified very, very quickly, believe it or not. Okay, other programs uh, sometimes take months, um, up to a couple of years. Uh, this is one where you can turn things around literally in two to three weeks. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit more about how to do that. So, um, what exactly is blood sugar? Right. Obviously the name says it all, it's sugar in the blood, but really we have to understand where that comes from. And one of the main sources of blood sugar is really carbohydrates. All right, so carbohydrates, when they're broken down, they get converted into glucose. All right, some are very complex carbohydrates, some are very simple carbohydrates. We'll talk about that in just a minute as well. And essentially what happens is those foods are broken down and converted to sugar in the blood. From there, we have to get that sugar to somewhere else. Okay, we'll talk about that in just a second as well. How is blood sugar normally regulated? Um, slide turned out a little small, um, but it's a good thing I got a few more slides coming up. So, um, we should turn the lights down a bit. Yeah, we can't turn the lights down, unfortunately, because we're recording today. Oh. Okay, I, I normally do that, oh. um, so unfortunately not. So basically, when we look at how blood sugar is normally regulated, okay, and I got a couple of different slides that will give you different viewpoints, but really what we're talking about is when we eat carbohydrates, Right. Blood sugar is going to go up and blood sugar has to go down. So we have this teeter-totter system that the body has where we're using on the right-hand side, uh, you can see the pancreas is critically involved here. Okay. And the pancreas secretes two hormones. One is called insulin, one is called glucagon. So when you eat sugar and blood sugar goes up, insulin's job is to get blood sugar down. On the other side of it all, let's say I uh, forgot to eat lunch, right? or I ate something really small and I burned through my meal relatively quickly. On the other side of the coin here is blood sugar would drop low, and now we have to have some fail-safe mechanism to bring blood sugar back up. And that's where glucagon comes in. So glucagon, you can see here, uh, stimulates the breakdown of glycogen. What is glycogen? Glycogen is essentially a storage form of carbohydrate in our bodies. So in other words, any of the blood sugar that doesn't get burned for energy, uh, that doesn't get into the cells and so forth, that is actually going to get converted into something called glycogen. For those of you who have done um, uh, marathon running or endurance sports and so forth, you might have heard of glycogen. Essentially, it's a storage form of sugar, for lack of a better word. And when the body doesn't have enough sugar coming in from the diet, we then have to turn to the storage form, which is stored in the liver and some in the muscles. And glucagon essentially stimulates the breakdown. Once glycogen is broken down, glycogen, by the way, is a very, very complex molecule. If you actually look at it, it, uh, it almost looks like a fan, like a ring structure of all of these glucose molecules pieced together uh, like a giant maze. And what you have to do is you have to break down all of those gluc uh, glycogen molecules into simple sugars. From there, it's going to go back into the blood sugar, raising it up, and we can then use it for energy and for uh, other, so, um, other activities. Um, so just to reiterate, we have, with high blood sugar, the pancreas secretes insulin, 
and we're going to burn it in the cells right? or we're going to store it as glycogen. When blood sugar is low, glucagon is going to stimulate glycogen breakdown and it's going to increase blood sugar. So there's your teeter-totter. Um, so what happens, normally speaking? All right, normally speaking, um, what I'll do is I'll just draw this up. I always do this in class because I find uh, this is very simple, but I like to expand a little bit. So if we have an upper, all right, we've got our high limit here, and we've got our low limit. And here, this is the sort of uh, midline. What we are looking to do, normally speaking, is we don't ever want to go above the high line, and we don't ever want to drop below the low line. So when you wake up in the morning, let's say breakfast, lunch, dinner, when you wake up in the morning, blood sugar should be normally low, right? Because if you think you ate your last meal at 8 o'clock at night, it's now 8 o'clock in the morning, you've essentially been fasting for 12 hours, right? Okay, so all of the blood sugar is all going to have burned off and whatnot. So you wake up in the morning, blood sugar might be down there. Okay. Now when we eat breakfast, let's say we're eating a healthy breakfast, right? so steel-cut oats or um, eggs or something to that effect, what's going to happen is your blood sugar, why don't we do this rather, okay. blood sugar is going to go up very gradually. Right? And as we burn off the blood sugar, as we stop metabolizing that and using it for energy, what will happen is blood sugar will drop low. And by lunchtime or by snack time, depending on what you ate, you are now going to be hungry and the cycle will just complete itself, right? And round and round we go. What I want to stress here is that this is a very, very smooth curve. Okay, so this is balanced blood sugar. You'll see that we never go too high, we never go too low. This is essentially what we are shooting for. Right, in a clinical setting, in a day-to-day -day setting, this is what we want. Okay. Um, a couple of things here. Uh, do we have any other color chalk today? No. Up here, this is where insulin comes in. Okay. Down here, this is where glucagon comes in. There's something else that kicks in here as well, which we'll talk about in just a second. Uh, you might have heard of a hormone called cortisol. Okay, cortisol is a, a long-term stress hormone, an adrenal hormone. So cortisol kicks in down the bottom. All right, so this is if everything is working great. Cortisol uh, not coming into the picture as much when things are working great, because here what we're really going to do is we would actually eat. Right, that's what would happen. If I missed lunch and blood sugar kept going down, that's where glucagon and cortisol might kick in to break down that stored glycogen. Make sense? Okay. What happens then to this picture here? So blood sugar goes up, right? How does blood sugar get down? In other words, what happens to the sugar in the blood? There's three things that happen. The first one, as I said, is it's going to get burned for energy. In other words, we're going to have blood sugar, right? Blood sugar has to get into the cell. And this is where the cell is going to use that glucose for energy so that you feel energized, you can get through your day, and so forth. There's a finite amount of glucose that can get into the cell and can actually be burned for energy. Right? So the other part, which we've discussed already, is that any excess is going to get stored as glycogen in the liver or the muscles. Now beyond that, because we can also only store a finite amount of glycogen, right? Okay. Beyond that, what happens is any excess sugar from that gets stored as fat. Okay. How many people here think that fat makes you fat? How many people think that carbohydrates make you fat? Okay. Too many carbohydrates, too many sugars, and so forth. That's really where the obesity epidemic is stemming from, in part anyway. Okay. So by choosing the correct carbohydrates, which we'll talk about in a minute, and maybe even by limiting the amount of carbohydrates you take in, what you will find is that this curve will start to normalize itself. Okay, so what happens when blood sugar goes out of whack? All right, so what, when we talk about hypoglycemia, hypo means under, right? It means underactive, it means low blood sugar. But before it's low, it's gotta be high. 
right? Laws of physics, what goes up must come down. So what happens here, and I really wish I had, uh, oh, no, it's fine, I found a piece. Small piece, but hey. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, so here, let's say we go for the double-double and we're gonna have a nice donut, right? Uh, maybe a dutchie, okay? <laughs> So now we're gonna have our double-double, we're gonna have our uh, donut, and that's gonna be our breakfast as opposed to our um, eggs or steel-cut oats or something like that. Watch what happens. Here, instead of blood sugar going up nice and, we got this situation going on, okay? So blood sugar will spike, and you can see that it goes above the high line, right? It's a rapid, you can see as well, look at the time. Okay. It's a rapid and excessive increase in blood sugar. All right. We'll talk about high glycemic index and high glycemic load a little bit later on. So here what happens is it goes up too high, and the thing that you've got to remember here is that when we're in these zones, your body is sensing danger, danger, danger. All right. I've got to get blood sugar down as fast as I can. So what happens is we actually secrete too much insulin. The other thing to remember is that relatively, the more sugar we take in, the more insulin we're gonna produce. There's a relative relationship there. So when we produce excess and rapid amount of insulin, guess what happens? Blood sugar drops too low, and this is where the name hypoglycemia comes from. All right? But it goes up first, then it goes down too low. How do you think you're gonna feel over here? We'll get into some of the signs and symptoms in just a second. All right. What happens uh, when you're all hopped up on coffee and sugar? Look at kids, right? Okay, bouncing off the walls, all right? having a good time. How do you feel down here? Pfft, exhausted, all right? Tired, cranky. Uh, this, incidentally, is where cravings come into the picture because here's the other side, right? Is when you get to the bottom here, this is also danger. So you are going to crave sugar. Okay? You're gonna crave simple carbohydrates and so forth because here's the thing, the simple carbohydrates will raise your blood sugar the quickest. Makes sense, right? You're not gonna stand over here and uh, cook some wild rice for an hour. Right? You're gonna be on the floor and probably ready to uh, hurt someone at this point. So here, we get cravings for sugar and whatnot and guess what happens? Back up. So what you've got is you've essentially got people riding the roller coaster every day. Okay? This is, uh, I'm feeling awesome. I feel like I can uh, conquer the world. Over here, I'm feeling super cranky, super irritable. I've got cravings. And this is where, this is really where cortisol comes into the picture. Okay? And we'll talk again about adrenal support in a uh, few minutes. Right? But this Stress, right? Long-term stress. This is stress. So the adrenal glands now are secreting cortisol to bump blood sugar back up, and round and round we go all day long. Okay. Does this sound a little bit like ADD? Yeah? Does it sound a little bit like ADHD? Okay, hyperactivity disorder, yeah? So just as a bit of a side note here, with children and with adults who are showing signs of ADD and ADHD, I, the first thing I look at is I look at this. And I say, well, what's going on with your blood sugar? Is your blood sugar balanced or is it out of whack? Because you're gonna show the exact same signs. Here's your anxiety, here's your depression. Okay, so there's mood swings as well. So there's a number of things that are associated with faulty blood sugar. Okay. Um, all right, I think that's good for now. I like to leave this up and we'll, uh, we'll just keep moving forward and see where we land up. So essentially, well, there we go, okay? Essentially what we have is we have riding the high line and we have balanced blood sugar. Okay? But there's something else that comes into the picture just to make things a little bit more uh, complicated is we have something called leptin. How many people have heard of leptin, anyone? Okay. Uh, how many people heard of ghrelin, which is the other hormone, okay? So these are two hormones which are also involved with our hunger and satisfaction. And what you can see here is when we are hungry, the stomach secretes ghrelin, and it says to the hypothalamus, which is a gland in your brain, it says, hey, eat. Right? And so now we eat, 
and at some point we get full. Right? And the fat cells here will secrete something called leptin. And leptin is the hormone that says to the brain, stop eating, we've got enough food, we've got enough calories, everything's good. Okay? What happens when we over-secrete leptin? Right? Because remember this, if you are eating all the time, guess what's happening? Leptin is being secreted all the time, right? To try and tell your body, hey, stop eating. And then you bring into the fold this stuff here, where you've got the cravings going on. Well, here's the short end of the story. You can have insulin resistance, right? and you can have leptin resistance. What does insulin resistance mean? What does leptin resistance mean? Well, here's the thing. Right? I got the little picture over here. Okay. Um, what I left out is that insulin is involved with getting blood sugar into the cell. So essentially what happens is insulin comes knocking on the door and says, hey cell, I got all of this blood sugar. Uh, we need to get blood sugar down. Can you take it into the cell? Yeah, sure, no problem. Open up the door, blood sugar comes in, and it gets burned off and we're all good. But if insulin is being secreted in excessive amounts over time, Guess what happens? 10, 15, 20 years on, insulin comes knocking at the door and the cell says, hey man, I've had enough of you. All right, you've been knocking so hard for the last 10, 15, 20 years, I'm actually not gonna take blood sugar in anymore at all, sorry. All right, I am essentially gonna ignore the message that insulin has. And that is what insulin resistance is. All right, so the cells actually become resistant to insulin's message. The same thing happens with leptin. All right, the hypothalamus after a while says, hey, leptin, I've seen so much of you, man, just go away. All right? And so now we have leptin resistance, which means that I never ever get that feeling of satisfaction. I never ever feel full, I always feel hungry. So part of what we're gonna talk about today doesn't just necessarily regulate insulin, it actually also is gonna regulate leptin, which is super important, All right? We have to get both of those um, under control. When it comes to um, blood testing here, right. now, I'll talk about some signs and symptoms because that's really the way that I would evaluate things. Right. But clinically speaking, if we had to get evaluated, you will see that in Canada, um, those of you who are familiar with blood sugar, you will hear people say, oh, my blood sugar is a four, or it's an eight, or it's a 10, or it's a 12, whatever the case. Okay. So here our ideal range is between four and eight millimoles per deciliter. Don't worry too much about the millimoles per deciliter, more it's four or eight. Okay, so we want to be in that range between four and eight. Hypoglycemia is measured, I think this is too low personally, but I'm just giving you an actual uh, cited uh, reference range here, is less than 2.8. By this point here, this is very advanced hypoglycemia, I'll tell you that much, okay? Some people are gonna start showing signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia below four, right? But clinically speaking, blood tests will, you know, the thing is this as well, is if you had to go to a physician and get a blood test done, the physician might say, well, it's just under four, you're okay, right? In other words, they're gonna wait for the range to drop, 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 drop until it gets to here and then say, okay, now you're hypoglycemic. Which is why I prefer relying on signs and symptoms because signs and symptoms, you know, you don't have to be a doctor first of all and we, we wanna have blood sugar properly regulated. On the other end of the spectrum, all right, we have uh, diabetes. Diagnosis and a diabetes diagnosis, you know, diabetes is the opposite of hypoglycemia, although they are two sides of the same coin. So hypoglycemia is here, but what do you think happens when insulin, right, when the cells become insulin resistant? Think about it for a minute. If this goes up and insulin is secreted and the cells say, oh, I'm not taking the blood sugar, where does the blood sugar go? Nowhere, right? The blood sugar stays in the blood. And now what you have, I wish I had another color. Oh, awesome. All right. Now what happens is you're looking at diabetes, right? So diabetes, you might actually be riding this line. All right, so you're riding the high line the whole time. And this is why diabetics, it's crucial for them to keep blood sugar down. Because the blood 
sugar can't get anywhere else, right? They're having a hard time getting it into the cell. They're having a hard time getting it out of the blood, okay? One of the uh, common side effects of diabetes is obesity, right, and weight, okay? Those also go hand in hand. So diabetes, uh, also known as hyperglycemia, okay, high blood sugar, and the opposite of uh, hypoglycemia. Some signs and symptoms here of hypo, so when you're down here, and you can see that we have mood changes is one. So mood changes, as I said before, anxiety, right, hyperactivity, depression, sadness, right, uh, irritability down here. You might have heard of something called hangry before. You heard that? Yeah? yeah. When you're hangry, that's, that's right over here. Okay, I'm hungry and I'm angry. Okay. So how about this? Um, PMS, right? Four different types of PMS. Okay, two of the types, well, actually, let's go with three out of four. Um, one of them is PMS A, okay, characterized by anxiety. The other one is PMS D, characterized by depression. And the other one is PMS C, characterized by cravings for carbohydrates. Sound familiar? All right, okay. So I'm not gonna stand here and say that hypoglycemia is causing PMS, but I will say that you absolutely need to make sure that it's not exacerbating or aggravating the symptoms of PMS, okay? And balancing blood sugar will actually help inadvertently with PMS. Okay, so what have we got here? Trembling, trembling again is when you're down here, no blood sugar, okay? Your body's like, I need to eat right now, okay? Um, Blurred vision is another common one. Dizziness, very, very common. Okay. That dizziness is when you're down here, right, the adrenal glands are getting taxed. Right? Because uh, I don't want to get too far into it today, but another hormone that's secreted by the adrenal glands is called aldosterone. Right? And aldosterone is the uh, hormone that controls blood pressure. And when your blood pressure drops, right, you feel a little dizzy. Okay? So if the adrenal glands are so busy secreting cortisol, guess what? They don't have time to secrete aldosterone. Okay? And now your blood sugar starts going off. So if you uh, stand up quickly and you feel very dizzy, okay? pretty telltale sign that the adrenals are having a hard time regulating blood sugar. And of course, on the other end of it all, uh, relative to blood sugar, okay? really got to support the adrenal glands, which we'll talk about in just a second. Um, sweating. Okay? The sweating you're going to find up here a little bit more, right? Because now everything is hyper, okay? Hyperactive. Uh, what else? Extreme tiredness. Some more, um, I guess, a little bit more detailed on the fatigue, right? Everyone is fatigued. Everyone that ever comes to see me, are like, oh, I'm tired. I'm like, you don't say. Okay, of course you're tired, all right? But this type of tired is quite different. Okay, and what you're going to find is that you're going to get tired after you eat. I don't mean you just ate turkey dinner at Thanksgiving and now you're tired. Okay, that's a whole different story. What I'm talking about is you eat breakfast or lunch and then an hour later you're down here. And it usually happens after lunch. It doesn't happen after breakfast. And that's because the adrenal glands, they really get taxed in the afternoon okay, for some reason. So if you're getting tired soon after you eat, Right? And if you're also having a hard time staying awake at night, okay, you might find that you're on the roller coaster, you're feeling these ups and downs, and by the time you've gone through three, four, five cycles in the day, you are exhausted. And when you get to this point at night, right, you can't stay awake. Okay, so 9.30, 9 o'clock, oh man, I've got to get to bed. The other side of it all is that you might wake up at night, okay, sometimes feeling hungry. <coughs> Why? Because if you think about it, if you bottomed out and then went to bed, well, what are you riding on for the next 10 hours? Not much. Right? You're riding on cortisol. And in the middle of the night when the adrenal glands secrete cortisol, they also secrete adrenaline. And now I'm up, can't get to sleep. And you will find that it happens at the same time every single night. Okay, you wake up at 2, 3 o'clock, like clockwork. All right. Um, hunger is the, one of the other ones here. Hunger, you know, when you look at leptin resistance 
and when you look at insulin resistance, there's a couple of ways that it plays out here. One way is that you're hungry soon after meals. Right? So, man, I just ate lunch, and boy, I'm hungry again. Okay? That's a sign that either you didn't eat enough, okay, which is rarely the case in this society. Uh, people are eating plenty. All right? um, but it's a sign that okay, you're here. You're here the whole time. So up and down, I got to eat. Up and down again, I got to eat. And then when you factor the leptin into it, you're never getting that signal that you're actually full, that you're satisfied. Um, as I said before as well, uh, hungry um, at night as well is another common sign. Okay, so if you wake up at night, and do a little experiment. When you wake up at night, if it's happening all the time, try and eat something and see what happens. Guaranteed what will happen if this is the root cause, is blood sugar will come into the normal range and you'll feel good. And then you can go back to sleep. Okay. Just don't reach for the candy. Okay. It's a bad idea. Right. You'll be up again at maybe 4, 4.30. Okay, so these are hypoglycemia signs. These are hyperglycemia signs. So these are actually common signs of diabetes. And what we'll see here is extreme tiredness. Now, this kind of tired is a little bit different. Right? <coughs> this kind of tired, you might actually be tired all the time. Okay? So constant fatigue, always dragging your feet, can never seem to get going at all. Okay? Yes, there are other uh, clinical aspects that are involved there, things like hypothyroidism, adrenal fatigue, yes. But blood sugar should be looked at. Uh, I will say this. These two, extreme thirst, and drowsiness are very, very common, especially the thirst. And people often uh, will tell you, you know, I've worked with a lot of diabetic clients over the years, uh, people always say, you know, I, I just drink so much water. Right? And when I say so much water, they can never, ever feel satisfied. All right? They constantly feel like they're thirsty, they constantly feel like they're not hydrated. And the reason for that is that when blood sugar Right? When blood sugar stays in the blood, essentially what you have is a concentration of sugar. And so what that thirst is actually trying to do is it's trying to dilute the concentration right? and trying to flush that ex uh, excess sugar out. Okay. Uh, the drowsiness as well is also very common. I'm actually working with someone right now. And uh, even when you just talk to them, okay, sometimes I'll see them just go. Okay. It's a difficult one to try and uh, explain to someone. Because you want to be polite as well. All right. But as I'm talking to the guy, I just see his eyes glaze over a little bit, and he's like that, and then he's back. And then, oh. All right. and so I said to him, I'm like, how's that going for you? Like, do you feel drowsy all the time? Oh, yeah, in and out the whole time. I'm like, OK. So we need to get to this and really work on that. Okay. Um, hypoglycemia is obviously going to be a lot more, I'll say common, because you know, we can really rely on signs and symptoms a lot more and we can rectify the situation. For hyperglycemia or diabetes, you really need an actual diagnosis. And most clients will come to me with a pre-existing diagnosis, and I can work off that. Okay, blood work, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so just to reiterate these key factors that are involved with blood sugar. Okay. The first one which we've discussed is insulin, right, produced by the beta cells of the pancreas, and once again, lowers blood sugar. We've got glucagon which is produced by the alpha cells. Right. Just a tangent for a second here. When we talk about diabetes in this setting here, we're really talking about type 2 diabetes. Okay, diabetes mellitus or adult onset diabetes, which they're thinking of scrapping the name because kids are now showing up with adult onset diabetes. Okay, so I think they're just going to stick with type 2. Type 2 is chronic degener degenerative. Okay. It's been going on, this has been going on for a long time, and eventually the cells have become resistant, and so on, and so on. Type 1 diabetes, which is uh, called juvenile diabetes, is a little bit different. Okay. And what you'll find is that it's an, either an autoimmune, okay, most often it's an autoimmune condition, where the immune system is, attack, is attacking the beta cells. Okay. So it's actually attacking the beta cells of the pancreas, causing the pancreas not to produce insulin. Right? So that's something we haven't really discussed before. It's the other side of the coin. See, it gets a little bit convoluted once you really get into it. All right. um, so if insulin is being secreted over the years in large quantities, right, excessive amounts, in addition to the cells becoming insulin resistant, what you also have is the pancreas gets burned out. 
All right? So the pancreas over time cannot secrete enough insulin. And so now you have this double-edged sword, right, where you're still eating the same amount of sugar, you're still eating the same amount of carbs, but what's happening is your body is not producing enough insulin, and the little insulin that you are producing is now, right, the cells are resistant to it. Okay? And that's why some diabetics, uh, when they're really far um, down the road, they're actually taking insulin injections. Okay? But coming back to type 1 diabetes, uh, type 1 diabetes, the pancreas is not producing insulin. Okay, and that's because of an autoimmune disorder or uh, an infection, okay, like when you're very, very young. And once again, if the pancreas is not producing insulin, type 1 diabetics almost always have to be on insulin shots to get their blood sugar down. Okay. Um, so glucagon we've discussed. Um, cortisol, right, which stimulates the breakdown of glycogen and raises blood sugar. Something we haven't discussed yet. Glucose tolerance factor. Anyone heard of glucose tolerance factor, GTF? Anyone heard of chromium before? Okay, so in our bodies we have something called glucose tolerance factor. And glucose tolerance factor, we could really add GTF right here. Okay, because GTF works together with insulin. Right, it works together with insulin to get the blood sugar into the cell. And one of the key steps in correcting blood sugar is actually to use this, right? You can either use it as an isolated supplement um, or you can break it apart, which is what I prefer to do. And I go with chromium, niacin, and so on, right? And what that does is it starts to resensitize the cells, right? It makes them a little bit more responsive to insulin over time. Zinc, magnesium, and vanadium. Right, so zinc and magnesium, uh, particularly, vanadium is a trace mineral, right, so very, very small amounts. Uh, you might find it in some formulas, you might not, right, but you absolutely will find zinc and magnesium, and they're uh, crucial for a number of factors. Okay? Zinc is probably the biggest one here, but magnesium, in addition to facilitating this here, right, also one of the key minerals that supports adrenal gland function. Okay? So you can see by using something like magnesium, it's not just working for you once, it's working for you a couple of times. All right? And so now we're supporting this here, but we're also supporting this here. Okay, we'll talk about supplements uh, in just a few minutes. Diet, of course. All right? The thing is this, and when people talk about diet, we're going to talk about that in just a second, right? But a lot of people, and this doesn't just go for hypoglycemia or diabetes, a lot of people are taking supplements without correcting the diet. And when it comes to blood sugar especially, you're barking up the wrong tree because it's just not going to work. All right? Diet is perhaps one of the most, if not the most important factor with regulating blood sugar. You can support the adrenals, you can support the pancreas, you can add these minerals in and the vitamins and all of that good stuff, but if you're still eating the donuts, the cakes, the double-doubles, and so on and so on, you will never ever get to our ideal curve. Okay, close that, please. Thank you. So, as I said before, simple sugars are really what we're talking about. Anyone know um, what the average amount of sugar eaten in North America is per person per year? Take a guess, go on, anyone. Throw a number out there. How many pounds per year? Five pounds? Okay. So it's a little excessive, okay. but, but I like the way you're thinking, yeah. Okay. Five pounds was uh, maybe about 1,900. Okay, that's when we were eating about five pounds of sugar per person. Try 135. Okay, 135 pounds of sugar per person per year. There's a lot of people in the room here that probably don't even weigh 135 pounds. Okay. What's that? Yeah. <laughs> Story for another day. <laughs> but a lot of people, when they come and see me, they'll say to me, well, you know, I, I don't add sugar. I'm not adding sugar to anything. Right? Well, here's the truth of the matter. The amount that's actually coming from the sugar bowl is negligible. Right? It's actually the hidden sources of sugar that we should really be concerned about. If you are eating a whole foods diet and so forth, and yeah, people ask me about maple syrup and honey and stuff like that, those are fine. Right? Those are fine in moderation. Okay, what does moderation mean? 
When it comes to these simple sugars, I always say to clients, three to 5% of your calories total. For people who are down here or who are riding the blue line, you might have to drop that to zero. You might have to drop that to zero. So here we have a situation where people are saying, well, you know, I'm not really adding any sugar. Um, I drink my coffee black and all of this good stuff. And so I say to them, well, let's have a look at the diet. Okay? And if they're eating processed foods, this is what we're looking at. Apple juice, right? Pretty good, yeah? Some good whole foods, some good juice, right? Not so. I'm not going to count all the blocks. It takes a little while, okay? But you can see the amount of sugar. Look at this, one, two, three, four, five. We've got about 12 teaspoons. Each block is a teaspoon, by the way, okay? This is apple juice. Vitamin water. Um, great marketing, great marketing, but essentially sugar water. Okay, that's really what we're looking at. Sugar water and good marketing. Uh, Mountain Dew, brutal stuff, right? Out of all the sodas and soft drinks and stuff out there, Mountain Dew is arguably the one to really steer clear of. Um, also tons of brominated vegetable oil and, uh, and other things in there. Um, Rockstar energy drinks. Okay. I should maybe be saying brand names. Throw Red Bull out there, I'll throw a couple of the other ones as well, right? This is uh, the new wave of adrenal fatigue and hypoglycemia right here. Okay? And I know that there's some kids that are slamming back two, three of these a day. Right? In addition to having so, many sh so much sugar in it, we're also talking about things like taurine, we're talking about things like caffeine and so forth. So these are like artificially, artificially bumping up blood sugar. Okay? But same thing, once it wears off, you're back down here. Um, yogurt, Snickers bars. Okay. Yogurt's good for us, right? Oh, we should eat yogurt. Okay. I'm not, not a fan of dairy personally, but story for another day. Um, the type of yogurt makes a huge difference. Okay, a huge difference. There's a difference between eating organic, plain goat yogurt versus eating commercially made, sweetened yogurt. Oftentimes, this is done with aspartame as well. Okay, or artificial sweeteners. So artificial sweeteners are not necessarily going to affect blood sugar too much. Right? That's part of what they do. All right? They're low calorie or no calorie. If they're no calorie, you've got to wonder, right? what are they doing? No calorie, how do you do that? Right? Anyway, um, with aspartame and some of these other artificial sweeteners, there are other complications that come with that. Um, haagen -Dazs, oh man. How much ice cream can you slam back, right? You ever notice that? Uh, people just eat ice cream, right? For some reason, you, you just don't stop. Right? You just keep on going, keep on going, keep on going. Right? Especially if you're having a rough day, right? <coughs> or if it's that time of the month, uh, ladies. That happens as well. Okay. Um, you can see there Captain Crunch. A lot of kids out there eating these cereals for breakfast. This is just one. We've got the Fruit Loops, the Honey Smacks, all of that. And you know how kids are, right? It's not quite sweet enough, so they've got to add a little more to it. Right? And then we might be putting milk on there, okay, which also has lots of sugar in it, by the way. Okay, yes, protein, yes, fat, but there's also sugar in the form of lactose. Okay, so sugar is one side of the picture, right? And you can see where we've got these hidden uh, sources of sugar. As I said, you know, turning to natural sweeteners, we'll talk about some of those in a second, is a definitely a step in the right direction, but they shouldn't be a feature in the diet. Okay, it shouldn't be something that's uh, you know, 30%, 20%. Incidentally, 20% sugar is actually what North Americans are eating, by the way. 20% of the diet, of daily intake, is in the form of sugar, which I find a little crazy. What was it, the average uh, 756 donuts per year? How many days are there in a year? 365, okay, <laughs> two a day, all right. The other side of it all here, because sugar gets a bad rap, and rightfully so, but the thing that people forget about here is also refined grains. Okay, so sugar, sugar cane, refined sugar cane. By the way, brown sugar, the same as white sugar. Okay, organic cane syrup, the same thing. I love the marketing, right? It's always been an interesting thing to watch over the years. Well, it's organic dehydrated cane syrup. Sounds great, right? It's sugar, that's all it is. So with um, grains, right, when we talk about white flours, right, and if you think about things like bagels, breads, donuts, 
um, pizzas, okay? Anything like that, Wonder Bread, it's a wonder that they can call it bread. <laughs> right. What you're talking about is refined grains, and a lot of people, they will say, oh, you should eliminate refined grains, but that's where they stop, and it's important to understand what is a refined grain. What are we talking about when we refine something? If you look at the anatomy of grains, what you will see is they have three parts. We've got the germ. Right? You might have heard of something called wheat germ. Yeah? Uh, have you heard of wheat germ oil? No? Some people? All right. Essentially what we're talking about with the germ, this is removed in the refining process. And we either sell it as isolated wheat germ, or we might sell it as wheat germ oil. But the bottom line is this. We take the germ out because this is where all of the fats and the oils are contained. And a lot of these, especially when it comes to grains, those oils are very sensitive. So by removing it in the processing, we actually prevent spoilage in the final product. So we remove the, the germ. The other thing that we remove is the bran. Okay, so the bran is the outer husk. Uh, this is where we find most of our minerals. This is also where we find our fiber. So all bran flakes, all bran. That's all it is, okay, all bran. So what we're left with is we're left with the endosperm, which is really the inside of the grain. And what that is, is really where all the glucose is stored, right? Because this is a plant, this is a living thing, and through photosynthesis out in the field, what it does is it manufactures its own food, right? So it manufactures its own glucose, and this is essentially where it's stored. So when I remove the bran, and when I remove the germ, essentially what I'm doing is I'm creating something now that is by default higher in sugar or higher in carbohydrates. And it doesn't have the synergistic nutrients there to balance it out. Because guess what? One of the things that balances blood sugar is fiber. So when you remove the fiber, what you're doing is you're actually speeding up the digestion. You're speeding up how fast those carbohydrates are breaking down, broken down from here to simple sugars. And we'll talk in just a minute about glycemic index and glycemic load, all right? Because that really uh, ties into what we had going on over here. Okay, um, anything else on this? No. When we refine grains, I always find this very, very interesting, right? As I said, the bran has the minerals, right? So when you remove the bran, you're losing the minerals. I have another chart uh, in a different course um, where it goes on and on and on. Right? And what I can tell you is at best, at best we're losing 50%. Right? So it's 50% up is the nutrient loss that comes from refining grains. So here we have, uh, didn't we need chromium over here? Okay, cool. So I need chromium, but hang on, 87% of it is gone. And what are people eating, right? Cereal for breakfast, yeah? sandwich for lunch, pizza for dinner. Or pasta, okay. wheat, 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 all day long, right? That's why it's a top allergen. And then maybe we'll throw some cheese, 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 dairy, cheese, cheese on there as well, okay? If you are diabetic or if you're type one diabetic, especially dairy has got to go. You have to, have to eliminate dairy. And the reason for that is the proteins in the milk are almost identical to the proteins of the beta cells of the pancreas. So guess what? It's an autoimmune response, and now every time you eat dairy, it attacks the dairy, but it attacks the pancreas as well, okay? Because it's autoimmune, it doesn't know what it's doing. So by eliminating the dairy, what you're doing is you're taking a load off the immune system and maybe preventing overreactivity. So what else have we got? Um, didn't we also need zinc? Cool, so 72% is gone. All right. Um, Something we didn't mention, oh, we did mention magnesium. There's 80% lost. Starting to get the picture? See, what happens is this. When we refine these grains, we're creating something that is digested faster, right? It spikes blood sugar faster. And then on the back end of it all, we actually don't have the nutrients to support ourselves here. So it's almost like a double-edged sword, right? Where it just, it's even worse. Uh, the other thing here that we didn't mention is sodium and potassium, right? Sodium and potassium both are critical for adrenal function, right? 
because what they do is they're electrolytes that control water balance in the body, in part. Right? Sodium will cause water retention. Potassium will flush excess water out. Right. So if we're losing all of this stuff, we don't have nutrients, and we have high glycemic foods. All right. Welcome to the roller coaster. Okay, every day. Okay. Um, um, yeah, go for it. Is this only for like white bread, or does this apply to whole wheat as well? Um, hmm. Whole wheat might have a little bit left in it. Okay, but when you actually start looking at bread, you know, um, I was trying not to go there today, but we'll go there. Um, when you look at the way that food is manufactured, right, the actual, not even processing industrially, just the, the way that we prepare food, what you will see is that an equal amount of pasta, right, if I took the same amount of bread, right, one is leavened, okay, so yeasted and whatnot, it's a lighter loaf, and the other one is not leavened, okay, so it's egg and wheat. What you will see is that pasta has a better curve. Okay? So the same amount of wheat, the same amount of carbohydrate, but because one is bread versus pasta, the bread will spike your blood sugar, okay? the pasta won't. Okay? And that's just because of the way that the food has been prepared. Okay? That's where we get a little further down the rabbit hole. Okay? I'll give you some tips uh, and tools in just a second with glycemic index and glycemic load. Okay? Um, and also remember that there's different shades of gray. All right, so um, one particular type of whole grain bread might feature better than another type of whole grain bread. Some white bread might feature better than others. It really just depends. But the interesting thing is when you look at white bread, I find it amazing that they take the nutrients out, then they add them back in, and then this is an awesome thing, right? So we're going to sell you this fortified bread. It's like, well, why didn't you just leave it in the first place? I think nature knew what, what it was doing. Okay, so... Sprouted bread is a different ballgame altogether. Okay? Um, if I can just hold the questions, we'll get the questions afterwards okay? in about 20 minutes or so. So, five things that you have to do in order to balance blood sugar. Okay? And what we're going to talk about here is a combination of diet and we're going to talk about supplements. Right? So both of those together. The reason why it's called a supplement is because it's a supplement to a good diet. Okay, it doesn't work the same as drugs. They don't work the same as medications. They're different. All right? And if we get the diet in place and then use the supplements, I tell you what, I've done it over and over and over again. Right? I've had diabetics who are up here, blood sugar balanced in two and a half weeks, okay? like in the range. And then it's just a question of staying on the path, and uh, eventually the body will start to regulate itself. Okay. So... The first one is eliminating simple sugars and refined grains. You know, the thing to remember here with hypoglycemia, okay, the picture that I've drawn on the board here is really, this is the end of the road. Okay? If this is happening at every single meal, right, in reality, for some people, you might be fine after you eat breakfast. But lunchtime is really where it happens. Uh, some days are good, some days are bad, and so forth. The reason why I say that is because people who are having subtle symptoms, subtle signs, and it's not that bad yet, just eliminating these on their own right, might actually give you good results. Uh, eating low on the glycemic index. So this actually goes hand in hand with point number one. And I will talk about glycemic index in just a minute. I have a chart after this. So we'll come back to that. Okay. But essentially what we're talking about here, how many people have heard of glycemic index? Okay, so how many people have heard of glycemic load? Okay, so, all right. Um, just simply put, glycemic index, right, is really, uh, what it does is it measures the rate that blood sugar goes up, right? The rate means if I eat something, how fast does blood sugar get to the maximum? What they work it off is they work it off glucose, right? So pure glucose is valued as 100, right? It raises your blood sugar faster than anything else, except for beer. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> beer is 110. Glucose is 100. Go figure that out. Okay. So anyway, what they do is they say, well, glucose spiked the fastest. That's 100. And now we value everything else beyond that. 
All right, so we're going to give you a banana and we're going to see what happens. We're going to give you a slice of bread. We're going to see what happens. And so what starts happening is you're getting these, you get these different curves, right? So in other words, the closer it is to 100, the faster it raises your blood sugar. The lower it is to zero, the slower it is. So now we've got the difference between our two curves here, right? And we can, by using these, we can modulate that. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. Let's say you had something that caused a very low or slow rise in blood sugar, but it was loaded with carbohydrates. Think about what's going to happen, right? It might not spike your blood sugar, but do you still have a lot of sugar? Sure you do. And this is where glycemic load comes into the picture because for me, the glycemic index is a little bit antiquated. Um, it's been an industry default for decades now. But the glycemic load is a little bit new, and I prefer using that because here's the thing. Let's say, for example, I ate something that was very slow burning, but because I ate so much of it, my blood sugar got to here. You see what's happening? So my blood sugar is spiking, it's just spiking later. So the problem now is I'm still going to produce excessive amounts of insulin, right? I still have to get my blood sugar back down. Okay. So the glycemic load factors in how fast and how much carbohydrate is in there. Okay. So it works with quantity, it also works with quality, which is much better. Right, it gives us a much more accurate sense of, hey, I want to eat things that are low glycemic index, but I also want to eat things that are low glycemic load, right, in terms of my overall amount of carbohydrate. The other thing with glycemic index, which is a fundamental flaw, is that glycemic index is always measured on single foods. Right? So in other words, we're going to make you eat a baked potato, we're going to measure your blood, and we're going to see what happens. Now, I don't know about you, but how many people out there just eat a baked potato with nothing else on it? No one. All right? How many people eat a slice of dry bread with nothing on it? No one. Okay? So as soon as you start combining things together, the glycemic index goes all over the place. Right? Because if I add a whole slab of butter onto my bread, well, hey, fats don't alter blood sugar. In fact, they will actually make everything slower, which is a good thing. Okay. If I add a piece of meat, right, or some meat to whatever it is you're eating, same thing, right? Now we've got more protein, we've got more fat, it's going to slow blood sugar down. And that's where the glycemic index starts to get a little fuzzy. Glycemic load, however, will still tell you the amount of carbohydrates that are present in that meal. Okay, so it's a little more accurate. So we'll come back to that in just a second. I'll give you some values there. Uh, adrenal support. Now, the adrenal glands are the stress glands. Okay, so they are going to get taxed by everything. Every single person today, because of modern living, because of where we live, uh, the fast pace of life, and so on and so on, everyone is suffering to some degree of adrenal fatigue. All right, some degree. Now, in addition to supplements, which I'll talk about in a second, one of the best things you can do for adrenals is to really minimize your stress. Right? Some things, hey, you know what? If you got the job and you've committed yourself to that job and your lifestyle, you have to just learn how to manage the stress from your job. Okay? There are other things that we have control over. Right? If the job is too much and I don't like it, look for a new job. Right? If the relationship isn't working out and you keep fighting all the time and that's the source of stress, maybe it's time to move on. These are difficult decisions to make, but we can only do so much with food and supplements. Right? And this is where lifestyle, the real holistic stuff, comes into the picture. So uh, another thing that is very, very beneficial for adrenals is making some time for yourself every single day. Right? Giving yourself 20 minutes, half an hour, where you're doing something for you. Right? It's not about the kids. It's not about the husband or wife or anything else. It's time for yourself. And do something that makes you happy. If going for a walk makes you happy, if taking the dog out for a walk, if hitting the gym, uh, going for you know, a hike in nature, whatever it is that makes you happy, playing an instrument, do that just a little bit every single day. Okay? And you start regaining some time for yourself. You will find that the things that make you happy, by doing them repetitively, you will actually start to balance out cortisol. Okay? But the real reason why we want to support adrenal glands is because if those situations come about where we're bottoming out here, we want to make sure that the adrenal glands are nice and strong. 
all right? So that an appropriate amount of cortisol, blood sugar doesn't go through the roof, it's just nicely balanced. The key um, nutrients for adrenal gland function, uh, vitamin B5 or pantothenic acid, and by extension, B-complex, right? So B-complex, uh, you know, common supplement out there. Uh, vitamin C. I normally like to put bioflavonoids with vitamin C, right? Or use a food state vitamin C. Uh, it just enhances the effectiveness of everything. Key minerals. Uh, magnesium. Potassium. And sodium. I don't think sodium is the enemy. Not so. Not so. Okay. The type of sodium makes a huge difference. What? Can we hold the questions to the end? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So by uh, you can. What you will find is this, right? Out in the real world, you will find that a lot of the blood sugar formulas, right? These um, you know, multivitamins. Okay. Therapeutic multis as well. What you will find is that they often have a lot of these nutrients that I'm talking about in there at higher doses. So what you will find is that in addition to supporting blood sugar, they automatically have stuff in there to support adrenal gland function because they know, just like I know, this is what's going on. Um, supplements, right? So yes, adrenal support formula um, or blood sugar formula. I've spoken to you about the vitamins, the minerals, and there's a couple of herbs. Arguably, bar none, uh, cinnamon has to be one of the best for balancing blood sugar. Okay, so cinnamon, um, you know, long, long favorite, long time favorite for balancing blood sugar. That can be used as food, right? Or we do get cinnamon extracts. Okay, there are companies that make liquid extracts, um, capsules and whatnot. So uh, I normally, you know, just in a, in a clinical setting, I try not to bombard people with tons and tons of supplements. So that might be something that I would say, hey, you know what, throw that in the morning smoothie. Easy, tastes good, all right? Maybe at night uh, you can mix some into lemon water, whatever it is you're doing, and off you go, okay? So we can use that as a food, right? But of course, if the situation is really bad, we might wanna consider using it as a supplement because it's gonna be more concentrated and it's gonna be a little more powerful. Okay. The other one which works very, very well, and I'm by no means listing all of them here, is uh, bitter melon. Okay, bitter melon is uh, used a lot in Indian cooking. Okay, an Ayurvedic favorite for balancing blood sugar. That as well can be used as a food. I've tried using it a bit on myself in terms of cooking. And uh, what I've heard the best way, apparently, because it's bitter, okay, hence the name, uh, is actually just to saute it very lightly. Okay, that takes some of the bitterness out and it makes it a little more palatable. Uh, truthfully, I don't usually recommend bitter melon to people as a food, okay, especially if they're coming off uh, pizzas and burgers and whatnot. Bitter melon is way too far outside the box. So uh, go with the supplement. Okay. What you'll find is that blood sugar formulas have some of these things in there. Right? They've already got the cinnamon, they've already got the bitter melon, plus some of these vitamins and minerals that we're talking about. Um, Increase fat, that's right, increase fat. Okay, I'm a huge fan of the right type of fats. Okay, we'll talk about that briefly. Increasing protein and fiber. So by increasing fat and protein particularly, those foods have negligible effects on blood sugar. Okay, negligible effects. How many people here have heard of a ketogenic diet? Okay. Ketogenic diet is essentially where we use fats for energy as opposed to carbohydrates. So the type of fat makes a huge difference. Right? We're not talking about lard. We're not talking about cottonseed oil. We're not talking about peanut butter, stuff like that. What we're talking about are things like coconut oil, butter. I'll tell you what, butter is f rapidly emerging as a superfood in my book. I don't have time to get into it all. But butter, when you look at fats, you'll see that fats are very long-chained or they're very short-chained. Right? The longer the chain, the longer it takes to burn. Go figure. Okay? This is why our animal fats will hugely slow down. 
okay, digestion and so forth, which in this case is a good thing. Right? But butter and coconut oil, what you'll find is this, the, the chains are very, very short. Okay? Butter especially is the shortest chains that we can get. Uh, coconut oil gets up to around eight or 10, somewhere around there. But when you eat those fats, what you will find is, yes, they will balance blood sugar, but we also burn them for energy. Right? So they will actually increase metabolism, and they can actually help with weight loss. In addition to that, the type of fatty acid, which is called butyrate in butter, is exactly the same type of fatty acid that's produced by the bacteria in your gut. Okay? When they actually ferment or digest the fiber component of food, they produce the exact same fat that's found in butter. And that fat is used by, as fuel by the intestinal cells of the GI tract. Okay. So now what you get is multiple benefits from including something like butter. Okay, simple. Don't add it to the smoothie. It doesn't really work out all that great. <laughs> okay, the coconut oil, you can absolutely add to the smoothie, right? How about avocado? Okay, there's another one, which is uh, good. You put that in a smoothie. The texture comes out nice and smooth and creamy and whatnot. It's not super sweet, but now you've got all of those rich fats with minimal amounts of carbohydrates. The other thing... When it comes to fats, I briefly mentioned animal fats. You know, meat has got a bad rap over the years. Okay, it's got a real bad rap. And we've always thought that fat right, was one of the major causes of cardiovascular disease. Okay, so CVD, cardiovascular disease, heart disease. They always said, well, saturated fats, you know, animal fats, uh, cholesterol, the enemy. Right? They've now done meta-analysis. Meta-analysis means that I've now studied a whole bunch of studies. Right, 770,000 people, and they've conclusively stated that saturated fat does not make a difference to cardiovascular disease. It's not as heavily implicated as it was before. I always like to err on the side of caution a little bit, and I don't like to lump everything in one basket. Because here's the thing. I'm not advocating going out and eating bacon and eggs every single day, and we should all be having burgers and ribs and whatnot, and let's go nuts. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is there's a huge difference between eating a burger with a white bun and no vegetables versus eating a moderate piece of steak with a big salad. Right? Those are two very, very different meals, and they behave very differently in your body. The other thing that's crucial when it comes to animal fats, uh, when you look at those long-chain fats, what you will see is that those are the backbone of many of the hormones in the body, right? So we actually use saturated fats along with things like uh, omega-3s and omega-6, but saturated fats make up a huge portion of almost every single adrenal hormone, of which there's about 60 or 70. Okay? So in other words, these animal fats will actually help with adrenal support by two different mechanisms. One is it's gonna slow things down, and two, you've now got the raw materials to make the adrenal hormones. Guess what the other side of it is? Anyone know where all of the adrenal hormones ultimately come from? This is your estrogen, your testosterone, your progesterone, your pregnenolone, your DHEA. Where do they come from? What's the starting molecule? Cholesterol. cholesterol. How many people ever thought there were people out there with cholesterol deficiency? <laughs> Vegans, vegetarians, right? There's no cholesterol in plants, unless you can find me a plant with a liver. So here we have a situation where we have cholesterol, we have saturated fats going in to support adrenal function, to balance blood sugar out, and so on and so on. All right? So when we start eating these types of foods, all right, you might have heard of uh, high-fat, low-carb diets. Okay? High-fat, low-carb diets, especially in the beginning, can work very, very well to rectify this situation. As time goes by, you might have to increase the carbohydrate intake. All right? Just because the brain and... Um, uh, the brain particularly, right, it can run on fat and it can run on glucose, right? So sometimes when we remove all of the glucose, we now have to work a little harder to burn that fat. And you might find people getting headaches. Um, they might still get a little dizzy and so forth. So increasing uh, good carbohydrates uh, makes a huge difference, okay? Um, we'll leave protein alone for now, okay, because protein is pretty straightforward. Um, you know, we spoke about meats, but there's also protein in the plant world, Okay. Um, things like beans, right? We have to be a little bit careful with beans. Everyone always says, beans, great protein, right? Well, I'll tell you this much, that even kidney beans, which have the highest amount of protein, 
are 25% protein, which means that there's 75% carbohydrate. All right. Now, beans, I'll tell you right now, are not going to spike. Okay, they're not going to spike blood sugar because those types of carbohydrates, a lot of them, well, all of them, in fact, are complex, which means that they're very big molecules. They take a long time to break down. And there's also lots of fiber, which is going to slow things down. Okay, so beans are a great addition. Um, all right. I wish we had a bigger projector sometimes. Okay, or the light's off. These uh, charts are very commonly available. So we're going to come back to glycemic index, glycemic load for just a second. And if you remember correctly, glycemic index is how fast something spikes, right? How fast it raises your blood sugar. Glycemic load is how fast plus how much carbohydrate is in there. So here, what you can see, um, sorry, golden rules. All right, glycemic index, we want to be below 50. That's considered low glycemic index eating. Okay, so below 50. Glycemic load is a little bit different because it's an overall load that's counted on a daily basis. And uh, Patrick Holford, um, author of Optimum Nutrition Bible, according to him, he's really championed and, and forwarded glycemic load uh, quite heavily over the years. What he suggests is that we should be eating 50 glycemic loads per day and under if we want to balance blood sugar. And if we want to lose weight, we might actually have to introduce, uh, decrease that more. Now, the, the point that I really want to stress here, we're not talking about calorie restriction. Okay, that's not what I'm advocating. Because if I reduce my glycemic load, my net carbohydrates, and I increase protein, my calories are still good. But what's happening now is my net amount of carbohydrates is different, and that's what's lower. Okay, so important to mention. What you'll see here, um, you'll see things like bean sprouts, right? Well, some of these things that have high GI have low GL. Okay? Some of the things that are low glycemic index can actually have a high glycemic load. And that's why I prefer working off the glycemic load a little more. What you will see here is, um, let's pick something like, let's look at carrots for a minute. What you can see is that glycemic index is 47, so it's below our 50. These are raw carrots, by the way. Okay, when you cook carrots, the glycemic index goes up. People go, why? What's the difference between eating a raw carrot and a, uh, a cooked carrot? Doesn't the one taste sweeter? Yeah, the cooked carrot is much sweeter because what you've done is you've essentially digested those carbohydrates from big molecules to small molecules in the oven. <coughs> So eating raw carrots is very different. So what you'll see here is that, yes, it's around 47, and here we have a glycemic load of 2. Let's look at some other ones here. Uh, look at ice cream. Ice cream is always a good one to look at. Some of the ice cream is actually even lower than this. Okay, so you can see in terms of pure glucose, which is 100, Ice cream is at 61, which actually means it's not super high on the glycemic index, right? It's not going to spike your blood sugar up too much because there's a lot of fat. Yeah, ice cream's a lot of fat, right? A lot of milk proteins and so forth. So it doesn't spike your blood sugar up very fast, but how much sugar is in there? We saw the haagen earlier, okay? So now if you eat a whole thing of haagen what happens to the glycemic load? Now we've got a glycemic load of 10, but that is per one cup. A cup is not very big. I'm not talking about a coffee mug. I'm talking about an actual cup. You know you can burn through a cup on a Friday night. No problem, right? OK. So now, if I'm supposed to be eating 50 glycemic loads per day, and I have a cup of ice cream, there's 10 gone. So think about what's going on here, right? If I'm going breakfast, lunch, dinner, and I want to keep those, let's say I'm eating three meals. I got 50 glycemic loads to work with. That's it, over three meals. If I go and spend 10 of those just on ice cream, right, and then I might go with um, some white bread, one slice, one slice, right, is another 10. Can you see what starts happening, right? You can see that as the glycemic load goes up, the portion sizes go down, right? Smaller amounts, right? give us overall higher glycemic loads. When we start looking at other things, um, what else have we got here? 
apples, carrots, oranges, even bananas. Look how high that is. It's at 14. Okay, that's per one. So one banana in the morning, there's 14 gone for the day. Okay. I think you get the picture. Um, this stuff is readily available online. And again, we want to stick below 50, and we want to stick uh, as, uh, on the glycemic index, and we want to stick at uh, 50 glycemic loads per day. The other thing that I want to wrap up here with is uh, the timing of eating. All right, when to eat. Traditionally speaking, what people have always said is, hey, eat smaller meals more frequently. Okay. Does that make sense? Think about it. If I eat smaller meals more frequently, what happens to my curve? Well, smaller meal means that I might not go too high. Great. Smaller meal more frequently also means that I prevent this from happening. Makes sense, right? Okay. So if I've always got a little bit of food in, I'm never going to go high because I haven't physically eaten it much, mu that much. I'm also never going to drop too low because the next meal is just around the corner. Now that sounds good, right? That sounds good. But in reality, what's actually happening? Again, uh, another client this week, I had to speak to him about grazing. Grazing, bad news. All right, bad news. Because when you graze all the time, when you're eating these meals all the time, you never actually give your blood sugar a chance to drop. And that's a bad thing. Because if, so if I'm here, what happens when I'm eating small meals more frequently? This is what's happening. Okay, you're gonna look at a curve more like that. And what are the consequences? Well, every single time when your blood sugar is up, insulin is up. So now we're still producing insulin. We might not be producing excessive amounts, like in, in terms of a spike, but we're still producing it all day long because we're grazing. The other side of it all is that we're also producing leptin along with that to try and give us the satisfaction signal. So you actually land up with the end result over time. Obviously, this is better than our big curve, but it's actually newer research is showing us that this is maybe not the best way. And what I will say is including those proteins and fats along with complex carbohydrates and actually eating three meals a day will give us the original curve that I had. Okay? We're going to look at this. This is what we really want. We want that gentle curve. Okay? Because when you get low, your body says, hey, I'm hungry, let's eat. When you get up here, stop eating. Okay? So we want to turn those signals back on. And the addition of proteins, fats, fiber, and so forth will help to do that. Mm -hmm.